As we want really Next speaker is Peter Rowland, who's going to give us more than 60 reasons for using the algebraic Milpertin version of the Dirac equation. I'm sure by the end of this talk it's going to be 70, it's going up all the time. It certainly is. It started off as 20 when I gave the title for this, but I couldn't keep it down less than 60. Well, it means one then per minute. Yeah, it's one per minute per minute. And the, the, this is the abstract today. It's, it's the, I think this is so powerful at producing new results and explaining it existing. And so then I'm proposing this ought to be the standard version of relativistic quantum mechanics. So, this is the conventional Dirac equation. It's the most important equation relating to fundamental particles because it is the equation for the fermion. And each of those gamma terms is a 4 by 4 matrix, which means that the wave function must have four simultaneous solutions. Which, and so the psi on the right is a four-component co four column vector or spinner. So the gamma matrices were uh, intended to linearize the Klein-Gordon equation. Thank you. Um, and at the time, that seemed to be the most appropriate way of doing it. All are anti-commutative with each other. Gamma naught is the square of the identity matrix, and the gamma one, two, three are squares of the minus identity matrix. Mutually orthogonal components of an object which is which has vector properties. But that's not the complete algebra because to complete the algebra you need a fifth term, gamma 5, which is another square root of the identity matrix. Now if you take the multinomial product of those gammas, you'll get a group of order 64, of which the gammas then become the generators, or a set of generators of that group. And those are typical gamma matrices. And if you use those sort of gamma matrices, you might get an equation something like this. Now, I don't like this equation for many reasons. First of all, there's far too much trying to say too little. There's all 16 terms times 4 to 64 terms. I would rather would reduce it to one term on the left. To and the other thing I don't like about it is the asymmetry of the dx and dy, for example, where one is imaginary and the other one's real. That's not what happens in nature. The rotation symmetric, but here they aren't. So it's, it doesn't look like that's the natural way of doing it. So seemingly compact, there's a lot that's redundant. There's a lot of stuff there to get a relatively small amount of information. One operator takes 16 terms. Also, the matrices aren't unique. There are many different ways of doing them. And it seems that particular problems require different versions of the matrices. And that's something else I don't like very much. Now, we can get rid of some of this arbitrariness if we recognise that the Dirac algebra is really disguised Clifford algebra. Mm. And Clifford algebra is a natural representation of physical space. So if we can bring Clifford algebra, we can bring something that's kind of natural physical into it, instead of this strange mathematics. And Hesterners and Dixon and other authors have used a single Clifford 3-0, which is a Clifford algebra of three-dimensional space. H Hesterners calls it multivariate vector algebra, and he defines a, a vector, a, a, a full product of vectors, for example, of vectors A and B there in the blue at the bottom, a b equals a dot b plus i a cross b. And when he works this through, he finds out the a i a cross b is really responsible for this spin term in quantum mechanics. But what I don't like about Heston's work is that even though he introduces this, which is great, he does great things with it, he still sticks with gammas or alphas and betas, which were the precursors of gammas. And I don't think that that's necessary at all. And you get, I think you get a much more significant uh, development when you use a double Clifford algebra. So you use real numbers, complex numbers, H, which is quaternions, and another group of quaternions, two sets of quaternions. 
And that gives you 64 elements and removes the whole of the gamma matrix construction. You don't need any matrices at all. Uh, there's lots of ways of doing that from conventional theory using double power matrices, and all these produce successful results. Sydney and I, a couple of years ago, tracked down eight different equivalents in a VGA paper. But what led me in this direction isn't that this is convenient, isn't that this is nice algebra, but that this is physics. Because I was driven by what I thought physics was at the fundamental level. And at the fundamental level I had a kind of periodic table for physics with just four elements in it. Space, time, charge and mass, sorry, mass, time, charge and space. Mass being undifferentiated energy like the Higgs field or something of that kind. Not discrete mass yet. So we had a scalar and a pseudo scalar for time, a quaternion for charge, and a multivariate vector for space. The only thing that was peculiar about that was using the quaternion for charge. Because many people would say, what's this quaternion? Well, I say there's three types of charge, electric, strong and weak. There are three sources other than gravity. And those three can be described by a quaternion. And you say, well, why? Because they're all different. Well, they become different, but they start off the same. And I'll show how they become different. This is the, what I call the periodic table, it's like your category theory diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an absolute opposition. This is 40 odd years old in my, old in my work, and it's, I've never found anything which broke it. So I take that very seriously, because I think this is what you have to start physics with. And if I put that algebra together, I get this 64-part algebra, which matches the Dirac. And let's have a look at that. This is it. The red terms there, you see, are quaternions. The blue ones are multivariate vectors. And this is, and there the, the, the black eyes are complex numbers. And there's 64 terms. And those can be matched up to the Dirac terms when you multiply them out and get 64. And if I take any line on that table, I can use those as the generators of the algebra, or at least generators if I complexify. They're either directly generators or generators when complexified. And if I take the first line on that, I can use those instead of my gamma matrices. And this is the RCHH algebra. You can use any of those things to generate. Any, any. I can, I can write the equation using any of them. I can also write the equation this way, using double vectors. Because the thing about vectors and quaternions is that they just transpose each other by multiplying by complex numbers. So I can actually write it as double vectors. And this is physically significant, because this means that I'm working with a double space. One space is the space as we know it, that's the blue one. But the other space is a different space which doesn't have any physical direct significance because it's made up of charge, time and mass. It's not a space in the ordinary sense. It's only a space algebraically. And I, I will eventually call that vacuum space. I could also use double quaternions if they it complexified. So this is the RCHH algebra. Complexified double quaternion. So I've got at least three representations there, many others as well. Now I want to say something about octonians, and I'm going to quote, I'm not going to read it all out, but I'm going to quote something I wrote in 2009. So the symmetry between the parameters show that all the properties can be conjugated in one cycle of the algebra, which seemingly imparts a special meaning to an algebra of eight units. And that's the eight units, that's the real complex quaternions and vectors. The algebras of the parameters of subalgebra are single Clifford algebra of this dimension. But because these subalgebras are commutative, the combination becomes equivalent to a double Clifford algebra, which in mathematical terms seems to allow the creation of an eight component cycle on which you can map. And I say mathematics does the same by adding a new property which we call anti-associativity, which gives us octonians. Now I'm saying we can map these onto octonians. Octonians are similar, but it's not octonians. 
And the reason why I don't use octonions is because I think that they violate the, the time sequence in the way they do on the associate it. So this is another way of doing it. I get two sets of Pauli matrices, and I can write the five generators using two sets of Pauli matrices. And two sets of Pauli matrices can also be represented as two sets of vectors. So there are lots of different tricks you can do. Let's go back to this. Uh, because I've used the word nilpotent, and this is number one of these 60 odd. The nilpotent Dirac equation. Very simple to create out of the existing one. We simply multiply the existing one from the left by minus i gamma 5. The significance of that is that basically it doesn't change the gamma naught, the gamma 1, the gamma 2, gamma 3. It simply cycles them into a different form of the same but it incorporates gamma 5 onto the math term. And then we, we have a different looking equation. I'll do it now using the, the, the vector algebra. So I'm choosing that set. I can choose plus or minus. The minus is just for the convenience of how it works out. I'm going to use, plus, I'm going to use that set of five. I can choose any set of five uh, that will give the, the, the whole algebra on that set of five will. Did you take the first line you showed with the... Okay. Yeah, I didn't quite because I used minuses instead. Okay. But, it, but I could have used the first line. Yeah. If I'd done that, I would have got you know, something different here. Okay. So I don't want to do that. But I'll explain why. Because I want the amplitude to be positives. Okay. So I choose to get my differentials as negatives. Good. And so I start off with that equation there is the Dirac equation in this version. And the, the, the thing to notice is that the mass term now has a quaternion on it, not just a complex number, which means that it can square to zero, which is the key thing I want to do. Now, let's see what happens if I take the plane wave solution for this equation. The first thing you ever do, take the plane wave solution. The first thing I ever do is take the plane wave solution, and when I do it, I get that object there comes out from the differenti differentiation. And when I look at that equation, I see that E can't be zero, the E term, so the A times the bracket must be zero. And the only way that can be zero is if the A is identical to that, or just a scalar multiple of it. So we now know what our A must be to get to solve this equation. And it must be the same, it must be this. And it must be square to zero. And so the thing about this method is that every time we write a wave function or a spinner, we get a, an exact statement of what it is. It's not a black box hidden behind a sign. It's completely direct and in the open, whatever it is. And if I look at that object again, I'll, I'll write it out in full there, and square it, I will now get Einstein's, just classically, I will get Einstein's energy momentum equation. I'm just pointing out here for future reference that uh, this, th this is something that works out from Hestner's algebra, that the P thing. And I say nil, nil potency is equivalent to creating what we might call a point source or charge singularity. The charge is a, a, it has zero size. It, it doesn't mean the particle is confined to a particular point in space, but it has zero size. We combine two spaces, or space and anti-space, to effectively cancel. And the spatial extent is zero because the norm of that object is zero. The Pythagorean norm is zero. So we've got a zero point, as it were, from the cancellation brought by combining two spaces. There's no such thing as a point in ordinary space because an ordinary space cannot be pinned down to a point. It's got rotation and translation symmetry. We can't pin it down. But we, we get a point in this crossover space where one space cancels another. And I say this, the unobserved one that we never see is what we call vacuum space. And because it's multiply connected, it's a singularity, then we get all this half stuff. All that half stuff comes from the topology of having a singularity there. 
So spin half, berry phase, all those things come from that singularity that we created. And this is the simplest possible derivation of the Dirac equation. I start with Einstein's energy equation, brackets, uh, divide it into two brackets, and then uh, just quantize it in the conventional method that uh, Schrodinger used for the Schrodinger equation. And that's effectively applying conservation and non-conservation at the same time. That's what that's doing. And we get the Dirac equation for that free particle. And so it's a one-liner to derive it. Now I say the spinner properties in the algebra still hold. It, it, we're not writing matrices directly, but they're still equivalent to matrices. So it's still a four-component object. But this time, we know exactly what the four components must be. Plus and minus e for the particle and antiparticle, plus and minus p for the spin up and spin down. So this is, this is a four-component column vector with those four options in. And I tend to write it in that previous way. Now, but this particular one, it only involves automatic sign changes. It's like one, like one thing and three drones that just com completely always complete it. It's like the bag pipes with one pipe and a load of drones. This is one thing and three drones. There's not four separate things. They're really only one. One in four guises. And that's one of the reasons why it's so effective, because we don't have to deal with four things at once. And we could, we could, for example, choose the sign convention in which those occurred. Uh, it's not the only sign convention you can use, but if you choose the sign convention, you stick with it. Now, if I wanted to represent an anti-fermion spin down, I'd simply make the first one the, the minus E and plus P, and then all the rest of the signs would change accordingly. And those structures are true whether it's free or bound. It doesn't have to be a free particle. These E and P terms are generic for something or other in that space, something or other in that space. Now let's then write down the four equations that would result. Let's stick with the free particle for a moment. We've got one operator and we've got four amplitude terms which incorporate four different phases. Now I say that's extremely inconvenient. What makes it very inconvenient is having four phases. Because finding the phase factor is, is how you solve these equations. So why not exchange the side variation from the phase to the no potent operator? And that's what we did. I've written it in abbreviated form. You see one phase term, four, four amplitudes but with one phase term, and four operators. So that's now that the operator now becomes a row vector, the amplitude becomes a column vector, each with four terms in it. And we can write down, we could write down this. And it's obvious here now what, that, that the Feynman prescription works. If I change the d by dt, I get the change of e and so forth. And so for the first time, for the first time, we've never been able to do this before. There's no textbook in which you see an explicit spinner structure which can be described by a differential operator for any, but we can do that for any number of potentials. It doesn't matter if we put potentials in, we can still find that structure. And that's what we will do. In the conversion, the conventional version, you can't even do that for a free particle. The best you can do is get four separate equations. You can't, or four separate expressions, because you can't do it as a single expression. Peter, if you vary the, vary the phase, so I have a gauge term in the operator, is that possible to put an angle in there and have the time rate of change shift for the full things? Or are they phase locked? Uh, I don't know, I'll have to talk to you about that. I don't know the immediate answer, but I've got things to say about very phase. Okay, good. So I'll say, I, I don't, I'll have to think about the question properly. I can't give you a straight answer now. Fair enough. Um, it's obvious this is just a trivial development now. We can do the prime rule equation by quantizing both brackets instead of one. So that's, that's a trivial operation. And it's clear that the time golden equation only applies to uh, a scalar wave function 
Uh, no, sorry, it doesn't apply to anything, I'm sorry. Applying the Golden equation doesn't apply to anything, because the phase factor will always give you e squared minus p squared minus m squared. However, the Dirac equation cannot be applied to a scalar particle, because you, you've got one differential operator, which is one of these quaternion things, and you've got to have another comparable quaternion thing in, in the answer, so it can't be a, a scalar wave function that it applies to. Uh, that's how I, would, I do con probability density that way, and then if I can do probability density, then I can do conventional quantum mechanics. I'm not going to spend any time on this. And this is, uh, I'm going to follow up Lou's uh, method of doing discrete derivatives. So I'm going to do discrete derivatives for uh, time and space. And this, this produces an interesting result. Um, I assume that we've got a case where we don't have um, variation in the velocity. The velocity operators aren't in evidence. So I can now use partial df. Uh, I need an amplitude term. I don't need any phase factor for this, just an amplitude term. So I create an operator, but this time I don't need a mass term in the operator. Because if I put a mass term in the operator and I'm using um, commutators, it'll just disappear. So I don't need a mass term. So, so, so this operator is defining the spin direction and the k direction, as it were, as the rate of change of time about as y and k there, it's beginning for the d by dt. Is this a particular direction which is... No, no it's not a particular direction, it's any direction. Okay. It's any direction, it's got all three directions. For the directions, for the time term is specifically k. I don't think it is. Actually. You're talking about the red k as being the... Oh, that's a quaternion k. k. Yeah, the i, j, k vectors are the directions. Right, okay. That's a quaternion k. I'm confused about your colour. Yes, sorry yeah, I'm sorry, I can't, can't use colour when I do equations. Oh, I haven't worked out how to do that. I can do it when I've, I've not got differentials in it, but if you've got differentials, I can't do it. Not so far. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so I've got a differential operator, and, and I, after a bit of manipulation, I end up with this. That's my Dirac equation. Notice there's no mass term. Yeah. And the interesting thing about this, it refers to something looser. If, if, you, if you want to make these quantum as opposed to classical, you normally have to put IH cross in front. But it doesn't matter whether you put IH cross in front or not, because it will cancel with the zero. Because you've got no mass term. Yeah. So you, you've got a, a possible transition between quantum and classical if you use discrete this. And then another thing is that I hear a lot of people saying um, that the, the fermion wave function is a minimum left ideal which is an idempotent, it squares to itself, not to zero, and it can't be a nilpotent. Well, they're wrong because you can write the same equation in, in both ways. You see, you agree those are identical equations. The only difference is I've transferred the J from there to that. So this now, this operator now becomes a nilpotent operator, and that's an idempotent operator. So it has both properties. You applied the social term. And I say the nilpotent formalism is optimized for calculating efficiency. Even, even, it's even better than non-relativistic versions because they're quite difficult because everything's in the wrong place. But relativistic versions, every term is in the right place and it just drops into the calculation. Once you reduce to a single phase factor, you can do everything using a single calculation. But I think more important than that is that we, we've now got a, a meaning for this nilpotency. And to me, it means that every firm holistically and non-locally connects with the rest of the universe at all times, always. Because, to me, there is a, 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 re a requirement for zero totality in the universe. And what does no potency actually mean immediately? Well, it means power exclusion. If you have two fermions with the same no potent wave function, they're going to cancel each other out. And it doesn't matter whether they're free or, or whether they've got terms like this in, potentials. It doesn't matter what kind of wave functions they are, they will cancel each other out. 
And what is important in this version is only the operator. The rest doesn't matter. We don't even need an equation. We don't, you know, much as I admire the Dirac equation, we don't actually need it. We need the Dirac operator. Additional terms in the operator obviously change the structure of the phase factor. But you still get something where you've got a slot for the energy term, slot for the momentum, slot for the mass, square into zero. And the system is always power exclusive. So the wave function and even the equation itself become redundant. The operator alone determines everything. So the operator is a kind of coded message to the rest of the universe of what this particle is doing. It's a coded message. It, it sort of hunts around for the phase factor which will decode it. And there's only one which will. And when it's, when it's found that, it applies itself to it and it gets a nil potent amplitude. But there's only one phase factor which will give you that amplitude. So the operator determines everything. So I don't think the fundamental structure of physics is an equation at all. It's simply an operator, an object. Everybody says, what's the most fundamental equation in physics? I don't think there is one. There's just an object. Equations are a secondary consequence. So even easier to get on the t-shirt. <laughs> even easier. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So we can encode your operators in binary, and then run a simulation of the universe, which is essentially a binary computer. I think, I, I, no, I think uh, Sydney's looking into that. Well, if you can help me, that would be great. Yeah, you do. <laughs> As a computer would, scientist, that would, would love that. Help. Appreciate any collaborative effort. Okay. Uh, so even the spinner doesn't mean anything because it's only the first term that matters. Now consider you've got 16 in the standard Dirac, no, uh, standard Dirac operator, you've got 4 in the, in the wave function, that's 64 terms, well we've only got 1. So we've reduced it to less than 2% of the original <laughs> that you need. So there's like basically two types of phases, there's non-local and then there's the local. Well, that's, that's a different question well, which we'll come up to. Okay. I think, maybe. Because I, I was going to say that, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll, let me just carry on with this. Because vacuum now means something. We, we always talk about ether and so on, and all the hassle about that. But, and the, then quantum mechanics uses vacuum. What the hell does vacuum mean? Well, it means something. And, it, and because of this structure, because once you make all the phase factors the same, then you're really on the way to quantum field theory. You've really got rid of second quantization. You don't need it at all. Uh, because you've got totality zero, so let's imagine that we create a fermion in some particular state. It's got potentials, but we're not worried where those potentials come from. It's got those. It's, it's whatever state it's in. We create it out of nothing at all. Pluck it out of nothing. Well, then the whole and nothing left by the creation of the fermion is what we call vacuum. So it's the kind of whole and nothing created by the fermion. The vacuum isn't nothing, it's everything else. That whole and nothing, of course, is the rest of the universe which allows the fermion to exist in that state. So the fermion sees the rest of the universe as its mirror image, cancelling it itself out. So you're imagining a song, a resonance between the fermion and everything else. And everything we else. And not me. Yeah, exactly. Good. That, that's how it works. Mm. Well, I'll just do a little bit of trivial mathematics on this. So the vacuum is the fermion. Uh, sorry, the, the fermion plus vacuum wave, wave is fermion minus the fermion, which is zero. And of course, because it's also nil potent, it's minus what the expression for the fermion was, and it will square to zero. So both the combination state and the superposition state are zero. And I'm saying this is what having two vector spaces is all about. We create the, the, the fermion is in, the, is in one space and the rest of you know, the rest is in vacuum space. 
So the nil potency defines the interaction between the localized fermion and the delocalized vacuum with which it's uniquely self-dual. And the phase is the mechanism through which this is accomplished. And another way of saying power exclusion is no two fermions can have the same vacuum. And now it's obvious what the difference between local and non-local is. Anything inside one of these brackets follows Einstein's Lorentzian laws, it's local. Local phase. Okay. Yeah, local phase. Everything outside is non-local. Su yeah, superposition, combination state, all that's non-local. Inside the bracket is local. Now the, the thing that happens that they're not separate things, they're the same thing in a different guise. So for anything local, there's something non-local out there. For anything non-local, there's local. And for example, when you've got your young slit experiment and you uh, decide to block off one of the holes, you'll destroy, you destroy the, the non-local uh, interference pattern by applying a local potential to it. So you apply something local inside the bracket, which then destroys the, the non-local thing outside. So that's how you get rid of it. But doesn't the destruction still propagate sublumin? Is it you would expect it? Um, I don't think it does. It's an immediate yeah. because it's not it's supposed to be. I don't think I don't think it matters because any experiment when you're setting it up has to be something. Yeah, you can only measure locally anyway. Yeah, so allowed so to do transient experiments. I thought we were. You can't move something faster than light in order to close the transients. Anyway, so if I can continue, they're not separate co processes. There's the same, two sides of the same. It's not either or. Now, Pauli exclusion is a classic non-local phenomenon because every electron somehow knows that all the other electrons are different. So, but in conventional theory, it's done in a totally different way. It's done using anti-symmetric wave functions. So let's do anti-symmetric wave functions, see if they work for this. Well, I'm going to do two anti-symmetric wave functions, and I get, end up with only that. And that, that I thought, when I got that result, I was uh, amazed by it, because it's telling me something. It's telling me the only way I know these two fermions are different is because they have different instantaneous directions of the spin vector, and even the magnitude matters down. It's only the direction. It's the direction of P which is different for the two fermions. And that's the only thing which stops them cancelling each other out. So in other words, all the information is in that P direction. So the parallel exclusion implies that um, no two fermions have the same yeah. parameters. And therefore, the number of parameters used to describe a fermion must be sufficiently many so that universe wide the, uh, yeah. the exclusion always applies. So, so, so you, you only need E, P, and M, in effect. Mm -hmm. okay. e, scale of values of E, P, and M. But Peter, surely, because you have me and not me, you need the exclusion from me and not me, which gives you a double. Well, that's the same thing. You can yeah. just reverse the process because the, the vacuum. It's the inverse of the fermion. But it doesn't that give you two degrees of freedom, which is a lot in order to do these spins. So, so the vector, two vectors then will be a directional one, and also the position vector change. Well, in effect, this is what we've got, because yeah. we've, got, we've got a double space. Yes. So this is the real space, P, exactly. and the E, P, and M bit is in the vacuum in the space. Vector, which is That's the red space. one. Yeah. So you need both. Oh, yes. Because yes. sure, then you've got plenty of space. Well, you need both, but what yeah. you're saying is, there's a unique value of E, P, and M if you, if you plot those on axes. E, P, and M, you can plot those on rectangular axes and you get a unique direction. And you get a unique direction if you plot them on P, P, and P axes. Yes, and there's two. So. Yeah. Good. So the entire information about everything in the fermion is telling that instantaneous direction. Now, of course, we don't know what that is because we, you know, we, we never will. Sure. <laughs> and the, it seems like a local collection, well, on I th I, the way I think of it, you've got all these spin axes pointing in different directions. Imagine there's a plane <laughs> uh, perpendicular to those. Then all the planes must intersect. That's another version of Pauli. All, all the pl planes must intersect. I also think that there must be a unique time component as well. Yes. That's... 
And I think this, uh, I don't, I think this brings in thermodynamics because it, it, whenever you do different directions of interaction, then there will always be a loss of information. But I don't want to talk about that too much. Uh, and I think if you look at it, the fermion only ever interacts with the rest of the universe. It, it doesn't really interact with just one other fermion, it interacts with everything else. It doesn't define its energy and momentum except in terms of the rest of the universe. It's a kind of open system. The fermion is an open system, it's not a closed one. And it's, no, it's non equilibrium in effect. And of course, anything that happens locally changes the whole universe. There's that line from T.S. Eliot, Do, do I dare disturb the universe? You know, and one, it's uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, Do I do, dare disturb the universe? Well, of course, he does whatever he does, he'll disturb the whole universe. So the Nilkovs and Zipalics who say that all these things must be unique. There's the same information is in the two spaces, but it's differently organized. And the reason is that if you go back to that structure that we started, that five component structure, the red ones are not, uh, are not they don't preserve the symmetry. They lose their symmetry, their rotational symmetry. Because the red K is on I, the red J, uh, oh, sorry, the red I is on blue I, J, K, and the, the red, whatever's left, J is on one. The reds are the quaternion ones. The reds are the quaternion ones. The quaternion ones, they have a broken symmetry. And that's why our three interactions are different, because they link to broken symmetry. And if, if you represent this EP and M on axes, you can immediately see why fermions cannot be massless. Because if they were, then you'd get many fermions pointing in the same direction. Not allowed. And then there's various other things you can get from that. And I say that Nilpotent theory provides us with a proper quantum field theory. You can do the whole of quantum field theory without having to do all this second quantization and all that nonsense. And See, we've got creation operators immediately. These are creation and annihilation operators, firm and anti firm, immediately. And you, you, you don't need that A dagger, A dagger, <coughs> you've, got, you've got them already. You don't need them at all. Another thing is, I take Dirac's prescription for translating his equation into polar coordinates. And if I use that in here, Something I notice is that I cannot get a nilpotent solution of this, whatever the phase factor is, if this term doesn't contain an R in it, because it will never square to zero. So simply putting a particle in the, in the field of a point particle with spherical symmetry means that that point particle must create a Coulomb potential on this. And I think that's related to what Lou says about curvature in, I think that's the curvature that we're talking about, is the coulombic, because at least that is inevitable in this. It, and, all, and all interactions have a coulomb term, whatever they are, all of them have. So all have a U1 symmetry, strong forces, the one blown exchange, weak forces, hypercharge, and B0 field and all that. Trivial to do CPT transformations, you just use the quaternions. Also, to get CPT gets you back to where you started. The CPT theorem is obvious if you do it this way. You can get plenty of standard results, I'm not even counting those because they're standard anyway. Those are ones that you can get anyway by standard means, so I'm not claiming those. I'm saying that. Lou and I looked at Majorana Fermis to see if we could make them nilpotent. And it, it looked to us as though you couldn't do it better than two dimensions. And I'm not convinced that Majorana Fermions really exist. Well, that, that, that's to be discussed. I had another look at that recently in connection with what Daniel was doing. 
Be because what he gets is his sigma 2 and sigma 0 and his oscillators are switched over. He has to reverse the order to get yeah. it to work, but that gives you a sign change, which is very suspicious. It's very it's suspicious. suspicious. Yeah. So what, yeah. what we're saying is that if you try to write Majorana's original differential equation and watch the algebra in this way, it, the algebra seems to have to be kind of mixed up. It, it isn't just separate. Yeah. That's what we saw as well when we looked at the rotation stuff. There's a, kind of, there's a factor of minus one which comes in on this. And you, mm -hmm. you get stuff, well, stuff that goes one way and other stuff goes the other way. So it doesn't That's work. It's also evident in yeah. Dixon's book because he talks about the Majorana having the weak mixing and that it's it's what you're I'm finding. I'm very suspicious about the matter, and so I completely agree. I think that's a problem. Yeah. So I'm saying that the dual space is relevant to many of these explanations. Yeah. I don't think we intend to talk about that too much. But what I do say is that we have this supposed problem of matter and antimatter in the universe. However, if matter is in one space and antimatter at the same time is in the other, we don't have a problem because we have the same amount of matter and antimatter. There's no difficulty whatsoever. You look, you look at those Dirac wave functions, they have two of each. And there's a meaning, there's a reason for it. Okay, let's have a look at bosons. They have scalar wave functions. How do we do, uh, write those down? Well, that's, that's, this is the way we do this. This is a spin one boson. We have fermion, antifermion, and the, the fermion and antifermion have the same spin plus p plus p. So side versions ensure cancellation of all terms and concerning coefficients. If you multiply all that out, you get a, a non-zero scalar. Good examples are w's and z's. If m equals zero, and that would be a photon, then the product is still a non-zero scalar. It doesn't zero. However, let's look at spin zero bosons, where we can reverse the spin as well as the e term. And the gain, you get a non-zero scalar. Well, this time, if you reduce the mass to zero, we'll zero the product as well. And a massless spin zero, spin zero boson, Goldson boson, don't exist. Whereas the spin zero boson will be a Higgs with a mass. And this is something I claim to have done at an AMPA meeting. Very shortly before they found the Higgs, my colleagues were looking for it. And I said, OK, if the Higgs looks like uh, if, if a Higgs is basically it contains a right handed fermion which is weak prohibited and a right handed antifermion which is weak allowed, or the other way around, left handed fermion weak allowed and the right left hand. So one of them is allowed and one of them isn't. So each requires half of maybe, maybe half of the Higgs field, 123. So doing it both ways, you get 240. Uh, 246, and it's, sorry, so each requires that, so each will require 123, and the, the extra two that you get is probably some sort of self-coupling. That's just a guess, but it's interesting. And then there's the final type of boson state, the Fermi-Fermi combination, the Cooper pairs, the Bose-Einstein condensate, Jan, Teller, Aronoff, Bohm, but very phase generally. And essentially, it's a, it's a fermion um, with another fermion type object. There's one particular case, most of those are spin zero, but then there's one that's a spin one. So you can see how it will work for a spin zero, but how do you get a spin one? Well, I think this is rather subtle because if if the spin one is made up of two things that are going in opposite directions all the time, for example as a harmonic oscillator, then the spin direction isn't the same as the helicity direction. Normally we, we've treated spin and helicity directions as the same, yeah. but this time they're in opposite direction. So you can have spin one but canceled with cancelled helicities. And so you can actually write it in hat form but it's still spin one. And this is precisely what the, the two objects in the helium 3 seem to do. They dance around each other. And I think it's like harmonic oscillator like that. And I've made a prediction that we could observe CP violation of graphene. 
And there was a man formerly in Manchester, I think he's now at Huddersfield, we could claim to go and do the experiment. We'll see. And my argument is that you imagine in graphene, you, you have a, C, a pseudo massless state for the electron. It, it travels at the Fermi velocity, which is the highest velocity in the material. Now, if you could arrange a quantum Hall effect or something like that, then you would create a. Um, it, it would be like creating a, like a boson state out of the Fermi onto the electrons. And in doing that, you would you would necessarily change the Fermi velocity. If you change the Fermi velocity of a fermion, if you re reduce it, for example, you must have increased the mass from since seeming zero to something. So if you get a reduce, reduction in the Fermi velocity under a quantum Hall effect or something like that, then you will have observed CP violation in graphene. And it was just a prediction. Um, the obvious difference between fermions and bosons is that fermions have weak charges, weak components, and bosons don't. So, uh, and we recognize the creation and annihilation of states from the creation of a harmonic oscillator. It's also the creation and annihilation of weak charge, if you like. Now let's have a look at baryons. Uh, baryons are complicated because they've got three dimensionality. So let's hit the, the strong interaction. Let's try to put three components down. Obviously, that first one doesn't work. It was zero straight away. But this one would. If we had the components on the different quarks, if you like, different, different ones of the three. If we had the, the three directions of momentum on different ones. And then you would get six possible phases, if you like, or you can have combinations of those phases, but there would be six basic phases when the momentum is directed along the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis. Arbitrary chosen, of course. And then, let's do that. Let's delete the others and only have those. And what happens here is that these reduce to a scale multiple of that. So it behaves as a single fermion along the P with the P momentum. That behaves as a single fermion with a Y momentum, and that behaves as a single fermion with a Z momentum. All at the same time while the non-local one is in the background, just L constant. Yeah, they're all at the same time, because, you know, it's gauge invariant. So they will all exist at the same time. And well, that's got the same structure as the color mechanism. What the interesting thing is that the second one switches sign. Well, you've still got all six phases because of the algebra. The second one switches sign, the P switches sign. But if you've still got all the, the positive and negative phases, then you, you, you still get the symmetry. And because you've got two signs of P, you've got to have a maximal superposition of left and right handed. Okay, thank you. Which explains the zero chirality of the interaction. No strong CP problem, no, no axons, axions. The group is obviously a, a color transition. It's exactly the same as the color transition. And it's like a transfer of P, the different ways of arranging it. Blue ones will then look like those. And one might see why only a third of the baryon spin is found to be due to the variance quarks, because it's only ever in one of the three components. <coughs> There's a major problem. I hope somebody's going to propose me for the Clay Millennium Prize. Anytime. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> because this solves the problem of the mass. If you've got left and right handed at the same time, you've got mass. And that's the Higgs mechanism. And even though it's transferred by the colourless gluons and the massless gluons, not the colourless gluons, the, the massless gluons, it still, it still is a Higgs mechanism because you, you're talking about left and right handedness. So it's a subtle way of doing the Higgs mechanism. I've heard many people say that the proton mass has nothing to do with Higgs. 
rubbish. It's as much to do with eggs as any other mass. Okay. Well, another thing is that this is a non-local interaction. It doesn't depend on distance. Force is independent of distance. Force is constant, if you like. Constant force gives you linear potential. Linear potential is what you need to get the strong interaction to work in, in, in the conventional way. Um, another thing that you can think of is if you now look at the, if you multiply any of these null functions, pre multiplied by K, I, or J quaternion, you get idempotents. These become idempotents. And if I, if I continue to multiply forever, I'll only end up with that. I only end up with that. So the idempotent acts as a vacuum operator, and we've got three of these vacuum operators. So you, you, in, in, in this way, you're partitioning those three components of IJ and K, the partitioning the continuous vacuum into three components. That's what that, those axes mean. Uh, and you can say it's via CPT and P trans, TC and P transformations, because they also produce the same way. Now let's look at this. If I look at that top one there, the K either side effectively just changes that to minus K. So I've got Fermi and anti-Fermi, Fermi and anti-Fermi. Anti well, that's just the same as Fermi. And this is the same as Boson. In other words, the fermion is its own boson. It's its own supersymmetric partner. And the boson is its own fermion. And essentially, this is supersymmetry without any supersymmetric particles. Solves all that problem completely. Removes the hierarchy. Because we don't need it. And I've actually done it. I've gone through the quantum field calculations in two different ways. And I get zero self-energy. It cancels that horrible self-energy term, which is the nightmare of, of renormalization. And also, we can now understand what the Dirac spinner is all about. Why do we have four terms? Well, basically, it's a basic term and three vacuum reflections in those three vacuums, which correspond to the three forces, strong, electric, weak. And the term itself, corresponds to the inertial law, gravitational aspect. And what about Zeta Bavagunk? Continual switching between the four fermionic states. So it's the result of every Fermi interacting weakly with its own vacuum reflections. So what I say is that every weak source is really a dipole. A dipole of itself and its vacuum reflection. And that's because of that I in front of it. That, that's that I which, as Lou says, oscillates. The I oscillates and that gives you the zeta of a And we can treat the, the weakness, the weak, especially weak aspect, as a dipole. So you're saying that it's a monopole, which is very short distance, this will then become dipole. Yeah, yeah it's, di yeah, it's dipole with vacuum. So it has a Coulomb term plus a dipole term of some sort. And it can't be separated from its vacuum. That's the peculiarity of the weak interaction. So I'm talking about partitioning the vacuum. I'll go a bit quicker now. And that's telling you what the three vacuums are. And you can actually work back from the vacuum to the local characteristics of these forces. And I can't do it today because it's too, too involved, but um, I'm saying locality and non-locality aren't opposite. I've already explained that. And I'll, I'll leave that. i not dwell on that one. I'm saying the non-local aspects of interaction create the local ones. So that non-locality between the three parts of the baryon creates the local strong interaction of being a linear 
potential added to the Coulomb potential. That non-locality of the, the fermion with its vacuum reflections creates the dipolar aspect of the weak, which adds to the Coulomb. And when you put those into the original equation, then you can start solving for those three cases. The Coulomb case, which comes out in six lines, and the, the dipolar case, which gives you the characteristics of the weak interaction, harmonic oscillator creation and annihilation, and the linear aspect of the strong interaction, which gives you the infrared slavery and ultraviolet freedom. Is it called ultraviolet? The asymptotic freedom. I've mentioned decoherence already, because I was never mentioned about the slits. And I'm saying it's the power of the exclusion which creates the Coulomb term in effect. But you're also effectively saying that three interactions are different aspects of the same interaction. Yeah. And the, another thing you, you can think about the three aspects of the conservation of angular momentum. Okay. I'll, I'll talk about that some, sometime when I can. Superposition creates the weak term. That's the superposition of the, of the, 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 the charge in its vacuum state. Um, I'm not going to do these, but these are the calculations. I did the calculations for those interactions. If anybody wants to see them, they can have a copy of a presentation about that. Um, other things you can do, you can cons construct propagators. Now, pr normally propagators have these horrible infrared divergences and they put these silly extra imagined returns which don't exist onto them to stop them going wrong. Well, they don't go wrong in this because the reason why they go wrong in conventional terms is because you've got an I there instead of a quaternion term. If you've got a quaternion term and you multiply it by its complex conjugate, you get a real number. You don't get a, uh, a zero. I'm saying there's lots of other terms, other things, but I'm not going to go into all that. What I want to do finally is something about this. How do you get fermion states? The fermion states, there's 48 fermion states. This is how you get them. The algebra creates them. I, one IJ, you multiply those four brackets together, you'll get the 64 part algebra. And this is the option of weak, this is the strong option, this is electric, and that's the particle and antiparticle. And this is what you get. I'm not saying these are the particles. No, it's more complicated to get particles from those. But those are the degrees of freedom available. Now, the person who's trying to get to this is Cole Fury. Yeah, she's using the previous algorithm. Yeah, well, she's using octonians, which he, which he gets rid of all the octonian components and ends up with an algebra similar to mine. But she hasn't quite got to this. But this is what you would get if you do that. You made it home with your book. Sorry? You know, uh, you well, I could, yeah. Don't tell your name, Mike. I've already emailed her. I've tried to email her. She, she, she blew me off because I'm off. nobody, but she, I tried yeah. to email her. Dixon was quite Dixon generous, was nice. Dixon. Jeffrey Dixon, I've, ta I've contacted him. He's very nice. Well, I think well, I'll what I'm saying is that this approach is actually based on physics. It's not based in the least on algebra. Algebra just came as an accident of the physics. I already had. Okay. The Milton, I'm going to say, the, I think the final thing I've said is the Milton construct created by a combination of the four parameters and applying zero totality creates new parameters. These are new parameters. E, P, and N, they don't exist before you, you do that. And these have got Lorentzian locality and quantization. And it also breaks the charges, in, the symmetry between the charges in the same way. Okay, and that's it. Can I just, to recap real quick, can I just ask, or say, um, so by exploiting the isomorphism between the algebraic and matrix representation of the Clifford algebra of the Dirac equation, you, the effect is one, you create a nilpotent version of the Dirac equation, and then you optimize the nilpotent Dirac equation by transferring the variation in the non-local global phase to the Dirac operator. Yeah. That has the effect of fully disclosing an explicit expression for the amplitude of the nilpotent yeah. wave function, 
and it allows the separation between the local and non local distinguishability between local and non local phases. And the other thing is it allows us to transition from QM to QFT. Basically, yes. The only thing I would challenge that is that you can still do a nil potent version without doing it algebraically. But if you, if you do it without doing it algebraically, you don't really know what you're doing because you end up with matrices, which is, which is a horrible mess. But otherwise, I would agree with that. Yeah, that's correct. There was something you said that you said um, there was when there's something which I didn't quite catch. There will always be lots of information. Oh there? yes, yes, that's yeah. when you've ever got change in momentum effectively. Um, any any collision, for example, always cost, causes lots of information. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. You know, any collision in classical physics will cause lots of information, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, it's similar to that. Yeah. It's just a quantum version. Let's get this and let you put your thing on.